Marcus Junius Brutus was very fond of praise. Even before receiving official titles, he was already awarded the honorary title of Princeps Juventudis, first of the young, for his oratory. Luck was practically his trademark. In the civil war between Caesar and Pompey, he fought on the side of the latter, but after Caesar's victory, the latter was still able to win his favor and even love. Just five years later, Brutus received the post of praetor, and three years later he was to become consul, that is, the highest official of the Republic. But something still separated Marcus Junius Brutus from the long-awaited promotion. The Uni family was famous for its centuries-old struggle against tyranny. Its founder was considered to be Lucius Junius Brutus, who participated in the overthrow of the last Roman king Tarquinius the Proud. In 493 BC, one of the Junii became a member of the first Collegium of People's Tribunes. Brutus' maternal ancestor was Gaius Servilius Agala, who in 439 BC killed the rich man Spurius Melius, who allegedly wanted to become king of Rome. Junius Brutus was keenly interested in the history of his family and wanted to one day repeat the feat of his ancestors, killing some tyrant. But where is this tyrant to be found? However Brutus had friends who opened his eyes to the nature of his benefactor, Julius Caesar. Look, they said, first Caesar was given dictatorial powers for only eleven days, this was in 49 BC, then for ten years, and now he is a dictator for life. Instead of being re-elected every year, Julius Caesar became permanent consul for ten years. And does he want to give up power after ten years? He already thinks of himself as a deity and has set up a statue of himself in the Temple of Quirinus, in the midst of the gods. Don't you see, Brutus, that Caesar is already a Roman king, except that he doesn't have a crown on his head? Marcus Tullius Cicero himself, the greatest orator of his time, persuaded Marcus Junius Brutus to kill Caesar. Nevertheless, Brutus was needed by the conspirators only as a symbol a living personification of the struggle against tyranny. The real organization of the conspiracy fell on the shoulders of the less noticeable Gaius Cassius Longinus. He, too, fought against Caesar on the side of Pompey and, like Brutus, was pardoned by the victor after the defeat of his leader. Cassius was a plebeian, but very influential representatives of his family from the 3th century BC repeatedly became consuls. The most daring and decisive of the conspirators was the tribune of the people, Publius Servilius Casca. It was he who struck Caesar the first blow with the dagger. Participation in the murder of the dictator of such personalities as the people's tribune Casca and the hereditary fighter against tyranny Brutus was necessary for propaganda purposes, creating the right image in the eyes of the people. But the attack on Caesar was carried out by more than twenty senators, and sixty people participated in the plot itself. There were no proletarians among them the conspirators came from the noblest Roman families. What was it that united these people and caused them to desecrate with blood the sacred walls of the Curia Pompeii on the Ides of March 44 BC? Caesar was repeatedly warned about the danger, but each time he refused to guard. Was he really that frivolous? No, it's just that, unfortunately, Julius Caesar did not count on the swords of the guards, but on popular love. Although it wasn't completely groundless. The vast majority of the Romans supported Caesar. The army adored him and was ready to tear to pieces anyone who dared to threaten their beloved commander. In addition, the only social stratum that genuinely hated the dictator were the oligarchs, but Caesar did not see them as a threat. Meanwhile, Julius Caesar gradually concentrated power in his own hands. He could, of his own free will, remove from the election of magistrates those candidates whom he considered empty demagogues. He increased the size of the Senate to 900 people, and many of the newly elected senators were from Gaul, that is, by Roman standards, provincials and savages. Of course, the new senators were the perfect tool in the ruler's hands and obediently voted for any laws proposed by Caesar. However, often the dictator did not need the support of the Senate at all, 
he could act without its approval and issued decrees, falsifying the approval of the Senate later. The old political elite of the Republic was not at all happy with such a decrease in the importance and influence of the Roman Senate. However, they had no one to support them, because both the people and the army were on Caesar's side. Realizing that it would not be possible to overthrow the emperor legally, the old experienced politicians recruited hot-headed youngsters who were supposed to take on the sacred mission of ridding the motherland of tyranny. Moreover, most likely, even if Caesar had listened to well-wishers and increased security, it would not have helped him. The dictator's ardent haters were so convinced that Caesar was the greatest enemy of the empire that they would have gone through with it even at the cost of their own lives.